it's on. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce my uh, uh, guests for this session. And we're going to start with Dr. Uh, Bulu Mambu Tata, uh, who is the executive, executive director of library services, uh, University of South Africa. And she is going to talk to us uh, a very catchy title, Turning the Page, a Library Perspective on the Book Industry in Transition South Africa. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. When the colleagues in the previous session were talking about challenges of book development in the Arab world, I was tempted to say amen or ditto because it's, it's the same challenges that, I, that I, uh, I experienced in most developing countries, unfortunately. Uh, I, I'd like to express my appreciation to the organizers for inviting me to talk about a subject that I am very interested in, um, the subject of books. But I will focus um, specifically on um, the, the reading community as I, I speak to the issues that are experienced by the published industry or the challenges as relating to uh, the reading public, particularly young people. Um, the topic of my presentation uh, has been said to be catchy, but it's a subject that really keeps pre preoccupying uh, me. And as I've heard many speakers this morning, uh, I've wondered what will the book industry look like in 10 years? Are we in the movies now? Um, what will the book industry look like in 10 years? What will a book look like in, 10, in 20 years? And it reminded me of a story of a child who was given a book for their birthday uh, in 2075. They turned it over and they turned it over and they turned it over and looked at it and looked at the mother who was giving her the book. And the mother said, why, why, why are you turning it over? Said, Where do I switch it on? <laughs> so the context, the context of, of our book, book industry in South Africa and the the reading public and the situation of the book and the industry indefinitely in, in South Africa is, is one, as I said, is, is very typical of developing countries. For us, research has shown that only 14% of our population reads. And of, of the population, only 5% actually read to their children, to their young children. And and this is a, a study that was done by the South African Book Development Council this year. We contend with a lot of legacy matters, that a lot of published material are in languages that the majority of populations cannot read. Most of our publications are in English and in Afrikaans, and those historical matters have further ma made books uh, out of reach by most people or not available for most people and also that we come from an oral culture, that we share information orally, not through a printed word. And that to us is a legitimate way of sharing, um, uh, but it affects our consumption and our usage of books in the process. Uh, and the third context is that, be that as it may, that there are legacy matters that have deterred reading, be that as it may that the readership is so low, the issue of book development is one that has been given a national priority by government, by the reading sector, as well as by the publishing association. When Dr. Magni was, pre was speaking earlier on about that the approach to reading and readership has now been researched in a, in a multi and interdisciplinary way, again I was nodding, because we are only going to deal with the challenges that confront the transitioning book industry if we work together as teams, if we work together as government, NGOs, education sector, whether we are teachers, students, or academics, the publishing sector, and sometimes they say it's difficult to get a publisher and a librarian in one book, I mean in one room, and get agreement. 
um, and, but it's, but in order for the book to survive and to thrive, we are going to have to find each other and sit in a room and, us, and, and, and work together. Libraries, the reading public. And it may be that there are other people who need to be in the room, who need to be part of this uh, multi and interdisciplinary sector to, to not only uh, promote uh, reading, but to work with the community to make reading increase, to support publishing, and especially in this era when the whole issue about the book is changing and changing so fast. In 2003, uh, somebody that I thought would be here, Brian Wafawaroa, um, a leading author and publisher in South Africa, said that in order for publishing to thrive, there needs to be a policy framework that speaks to authorship, to copyright, to publishing industry, to printing and production, to trade and industry, and to the read reading public, including how book libraries are funded, and that if that policy framework was not created, the publishing industry, as well as the book industry, as we know it, will die. The challenge is how many of our countries have all-encompassing policy that speaks to that and creates an appropriate uh, publishing industry that thrives. And, and Brian uh, 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 Wafaroa went on within South Africa to, with his colleagues and with many of us from the publishing sector mm -hmm. to identify who should sit around the room in order for us to support the book development within South Africa. And what resulted was that roles were identified for NLSA, the National Library of South Africa, the former librarian, uh, John Tebe, is sitting over there, and you can have more conversation with him over tea about the work that the National Library of South Africa has done for the development of the book. And I'll talk a little bit later about what they've done for the development of books for young people. The Publishers Association came on board uh, the Book Development of Council of South Africa itself worked very hard not only to promote reading, but establish a book week in South Africa, first week of September, in which there's an investment in book publishing, in reading, in um, authorship, and a celebration of the book for a whole week, led and funded in, man in many spaces by the government itself. And Dax. DAC is the department in government that um, is, 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 is keen. And LIASA, the Library Association of South Africa, is also keenly involved on behalf of libraries and the reading public. So, so what are the challenges that are threatening the book industry uh, as we see them as librarians, especially around young people? And the first one is that the book as we know it, and the, 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 the um, the books in circulation are not really relevant to many young people. And so they are not finding the books that speak to them to read. On the other hand, we have publishers who are saying, what thing, how are we going to remain viable if we publish for all these small sectors, the, the, in these small languages, in this small group, how is publishing as an industry going to remain viable? Will these small quantities of books sell enough to sustain the industry? On the other hand, there's a challenge of um, uh, in a, unavailability of literature published in local languages. Research has shown that if people read in their mother tongue from an early age, they develop a, 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 an interest in reading. And so if there's no literature for young people to read at an early age, how are they going to develop a, an, an interest in reading? And, and yet, those sectors are so small that publishers don't find them viable to publish in those areas. And as we know, many of the young people um, most of the population of, of South Africa the, is below the age of 25, 65%. A lot of them are digital citizens, and they only want to read something that is digital, not the pages that you turn by hand, but, but you turn by a thumb on your, on your uh, reading machine. And yet, there isn't adequate proportions of digital content that speaks to their context. The digital content that we currently have is one that we import from the United States. 
and it doesn't always speak to the content of young people in South Africa. And there isn't adequate numbers or volumes of published digital content to address their interest, their language, a proficiency, and, uh, and re generate a reading, a reading culture and a reading interest. And so as we think about bringing, uh, creating a reading culture for the next, for the, for the young people, bringing reading and content to the next generation, we need to think carefully about what is it that we need to do and do differently. Can we continue with the business models that we have used and hope it's gonna work out? The kind of e-books we are churning out, are they the kind of e-books that will generate an interest in the young generation and keep them adequately interested? What about mobile reading? What about content for mobile phones and content for tablets? And then digital content in local languages. And, and the problem seems to compound itself, but we sit at the summit to find solutions. So creating, a digital, dig, creating digital content for young people, for this generation of young people, will indeed be a stakeholder approach, will require a multi and interdisciplinary approach in order that we address, the, address that need holistically. I'm going to share very briefly some of the providers within South Africa who have worked to, to make a difference, to begin to bring content in local languages, to begin to bring content in digital, uh, digi uh, uh, digital content, as well as content for mobile phones um, to, to young readers. And there's, there's four examples that I'm using here. I could have brought more, but in 20 minutes, and I've got eight left, I couldn't uh, deal with all of them. So I'm going to talk about the work that the National Libraries of South Africa does through the Center for the Book. I will talk about Nali Bali, Funza, as well as the World Reader. The National Library of South, South Africa, especially the Center for the Book in Cape Town, focuses on four programs that seek to, to bring, to generate content. A children's literature program, a community publishing program, an outreach and advocacy program to find and identify authors that might not have been discovered, and the reprint of African classics that uh, John so pioneered uh, many years ago. And their content is both print and digital. Nali Bali is an NGO, and it's a Sikosa word. Uh, here, I'll try and ask our moderator to pronounce that uh, during the tea break. It's a Sikosa word that means here's a story. And the title itself seeks to catch uh, those who are interested in reading and want to read in Sikosa on, on board. And it really seeks to bring an interest in reading in Isikosa. I don't know what happens in your communities, but in our communities, as people become affluent, they negate their local language. Nali Bali, in its, it, its work, seeks to bring an interest back to the reading in the local language. And if you can visit their website, which I gave in the previous slide, you'll see a lot more about the work that they do for both in print as well as digital. But their focus is to get people reading, young people reading and reading in Isikosa. That's, that's uh, uh, from, from their website. Another program is one called FUNZA. And FUNZA uh, is, is, a, is a cross of many of, of our local languages, but it is about reading and reading largely online, on the phone. And they have brought together communities of people to write for mobile phone. And they distribute their content on Mixit. And, and Mixit is a, is, a, is a chat service developed in South Africa. And through that program, they re, they re, they've reached 5,000 readers every year, young people. No, sorry, every month. And it's an excellent way of, of, of reaching people to read on their phone, as well as challenge them to write and contribute towards FUNZA. Um, so, so not only do we, does FUNZA provide 
uh, content, it also collects content from its readers. But what we've also realized, what the program has also realized, or discovered, is that some of the people from the rural communities do not have the wherewithal to participate. They might not have phones, they don't have um, laptops or iPads on which to contribute. But FUNSA's programs seek to provide even the equipment so that more young people can, be, can participate. World Reader is an international NGO that seeks to bring content uh, in digital format. It works in South Africa, but in a number of countries also on the continent. And what I really like about the way uh, um, uh, World Reader does is that it doesn't just bring content to communities. Here is content from uh, some place, but it says here is some content, but let's also build some from here. So they will add, they've been adding content from developing countries, adding content from countries where they work in Africa, Nigeria, Nigeria Uganda, uh, Kenya, and South Africa. And they engage the community in their method of work. They don't just impose solutions on the content, content uh, communities. And they work on scalable, affordable equipment, I mean, uh, platforms that can run on any equipment. And so as we go forward, the four programs that I've quickly gone through seek to mitigate the challenges that young people have of reading in the digital age, of not having adequate content, of not having appropriate materials to read. And the four programs that outline seek to mitigate those challenges. It is very clear, even from all the presentations that we've heard here today, that there's gonna have to be a collaborative, effort in order to sustain the book as we know it and reading. If we are to keep the next generation participating, then we've got to rethink and question our own business models that we've had, the protection of the things we've done the same way, because it will not yield fruit with the next as we, as we go forward. Governments will have a responsibility to provide the appropriate framework to create um, the environment that, is, uh, uh, that will promote sustainability and create an appropriate policy framework. And that brings me to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mamba Tata. And now I think we are ready for uh, Dr. Helena Asomoa Hassan. And she's going to talk to us about the publishing industry in Ghana. Any hope for the future? Good afternoon. I will also want to thank the organizers of this conference uh, for inviting me. And I believe that uh, in Africa, if we do such things often, at least it will let most of us learn and then be able to share when we get back home what others are able to share. Um, in Ghana, Ghana is about 26 million people. There are 10 public universities, 40 private universities and counting because they spring up by the day. And um, there are 10 regional public libraries and each of these uh, libraries has got uh, branches. Publishing in Ghana, I'm going to look at publishing in general, and I'd like to say that um, the print publishing is problematic, so that means that the E is more difficult. So we have that at the back of our minds. In Ghana, publishing is linked with printing. That is it, we do both uh, together. And uh, in the colonial time, most of the printing was done overseas. The first printing press in Ghana was in 1851 by the Methodist uh, Christian Mission. And an indigene also set up one in 1874. But then between 1900 and the 1930s, uh, there have been several printing houses. And the Ghana Publishers Association plays a lot of uh, a key role in this publishing. And it was born in 1976, slept a little till 1991, and then woke up when the code, the Can Canadian Agency, started uh, carrying out some advocacy and then uh, capacity building workshops so that uh, they will bring up their quality of uh, printing. Today, there are several publishing and printing houses available, but the issue is uh, what we're going to see. 
In Ghana, books are very expensive because most of these books come from outside. And I told you about the universities because uh, in Ghana, we use a lot of uh, books published from outside for tertiary education. So the high cost of book publishing has come about because one, most of the books are imported and because of that they come out cheap, printed, even those children's books are printed outside and they come out cheaper than what uh, we can do at home. The reading culture has been mentioned and that's a big issue. Then the government has got what you call the free textbook, a textbook scheme for primary and secondary schools and that scheme ensures that uh, books are published from outside. Then there is also no official national book policy. It's still being worked on. And then uh, sometimes government itself gets involved in some textbook publishing when they have donor support. In Ghana, everybody is equal when you go to the bank. We don't re they don't really care what kind of business you're going to do, so they're not going to give you any special uh, concessions. And the banks usually look at book, book publishing as a, as a high-risk area because the returns don't come in as expected. And then we have an unfavorable copyright legislation to check uh, piracy. The legislation is so funny. I can't even come. It's less than one-tenth of a dollar if you are caught pirating. So until that is uh, one-tenth of a dollar, it's nothing. So anybody can do what he likes. And the publishers have been talking about that for them to hike it so that uh, it can uh, change. So people, those who can, but then the quality when they bring the books, they pirate books, even from foreign publishers, they do that. The poor quality Printing and packaging also is another issue. It's a big challenge. Those who, the few publishers who do some work, their quality is not uh, really very good. And I've already talked about the cheap books and then inadequate funding for public libraries. So what happens is that they don't have enough funds. So even the books, the few that are published in Ghana with the Ghanaian stories for young children, they can't <coughs> afford to buy them. And if the public libraries can't afford to buy, then it means that uh, Nobody buys, nobody reads, and it gets stuck with the publisher. So how does he get his money to put it into another book? So it's something like a vicious cycle. Um, there have been some, a lot of suggestions going around, but then I think these are what we should look at. It's important to involve local publishers in government commission textbooks. There are people still in the country who can publish at least some write books, authors write books up to the primary and then secondary school. Very qualified people. But then, I, I don't understand. Looks like uh, what comes out from outside is better than what is in Ghana. Maybe that's what they think, but I don't think so. And then uh, it's important that uh, we, some banks, you know, are put down to support publishers and these banks give them a low interest uh, loans. Also, most of the printers now, they don't have sophisticated uh, machines, so it's important to get them to do that so that they can deliver as quickly as the ones which come from outside. When books are published outside, I think it will take about two or three weeks by ship. So if people within the country have got sophisticated machines, they could deliver quicker than those coming from outside. Then also collaboration and partnerships with foreign publishers, either to co-publish or co-finance. That's another area which can be looked at. And then they need to be a strong member of APNET, that is African Publishers Network. Because and if you belong to that, it's easy for you to share information and know how best to move on. Then there is a Department of Publishing Studies at a university. And it's important that they are supported to increase the number of qualified uh, modern publishers, printers, and distributors. Now they come out, and then some of them do not have really much to do. They just have small business concerns. We do not bring in any good money. Then every year there is an international book fair. And it's, in fact, I think it's on now. They started about three days ago, and I was there on Wednesday and the attendance was something not really encouraging. So it's important that it's better organized, better advertised before the event so that more of the local publishers can show up. 
Then the copyright law that I talked about needs to um, be improved. Intellectual property rights, yes, they are now doing something about it, but the angle, the 70 years plus, also does not you know, help as far as libraries are concerned, but maybe that will also help to do that. Then it is important to effectively market and the books, because most of these publishers, when they bring out books, the best you can see, it, it's launched on the television. We all see it, and you don't know where to go and get them. So the books stay with you. Then there is a Ghana National Book Council. Uh, they are there, the council is there, but I, I really don't hear much about them. You, they only show up their head once, say one or two things, and they go underground. I don't know what their problem is. Then it's important to have a strong efforts to reinforce the culture of reading. Just like uh, my colleague said, it's important to have reading clubs in schools. And now the Ghana Library Association is carrying out uh, reading clinics. They do it quarterly and that's really improving. The kids run around and they come, they hear they are there for the reading clinic and all of them come in school. So I think that's something that uh, we can do. In addition to that, if the public libraries are well equipped, I think uh, with books, the children will go and then read. And important for government grants and subsidies to support the writers, especially children's books, because uh, there is no subsidy, there is no grant anywhere. You do it on your own. If you are lucky, you make money. If you are not, the banks chase you for their money because you can't pay your loan. So in conclusion, in Ghana, the publishing industry is actually the backbone of a nation's literacy because you need books to read. Educational and literary programs are very key to the development of the nation. Publishing in Ghana was dominated by external publishers, but now we have some local publishers, but there's still room um, for improvement. Then it's important to churn out good quality books which are competitive, because if the quality is not good, you take it and it's newsprint, and the paints are all smudged, and then nobody is going to read that book. Then what is published, important and it should be relevant to the educational information needs of the people. Because you bring something which is alien, nobody reads it because I don't really understand and I, won't, I don't want to know about that. So it should be relevant to our social, economic, cultural and political needs. But as we sit today, uh, the book industry in Ghana, it really needs a lot of uh, improvement to get to the standard that we expect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Helena. And now, uh, from Ethiopia, we are ready for Dr. Aida Obuku Mensa, who will give us a talk about uh, the book industry in perspective. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Um, I've enjoyed listening to my two sisters here, because um, one of the things that I, I would do is that I will talk a bit about the optimism part of Africa, uh, and also touch a bit on the pessimism and then the realism. Uh, right now, in terms of, of this presentation, what I want to do is to show that even though reading is on the decline on the African continent and the book publishing industry is, is facing a bit of a challenge, there are a lot of signs that point to the fact that those who are interested in this sector can use the environment that is uh, existing to try to save the African publishing sector. So that that's, that's will be my, my, my take on, on, on this. So let me start with the optimism, the, the Africa's economic performance. Uh, this is a continent who is experiencing average growth between eight to five to eight percent. It is the youngest region in the world, and by 2040, the largest workforce in the world will be on the African continent. And the world's greatest sources of raw materials. That, I think, will have a profound impact on our publishing industry if we are to get serious. Let me also look at the scenario two, where it is expected that this continent 
who leapfrog technologically, and it is in, in, in many instances when we look at the whole mobile technology revolution. And that domestically, Africa will be one of the biggest markets on earth. Again, high hopes for the publishing industry. And it is preparing to take its place in a future global economy. So we talk about the lions on the move. And we, the lions, are moving. Economic growth is creating new businesses and new business opportunities. Domestically, Africa will have the biggest market. It, its rate of investment, ret return on investments will be higher than any other part of the world. And as a result of that, there are some mega trends that we also need to factor. Um, right now on this continent, we have to bear in mind that the language of development is about economic transformation. We all heard about the MDGs, and we know that the MDGs was very much a socially oriented construct. And now the continent is, is, is on the verge of looking at how economic transformation can change the business unusual aspect of Africa's economic development. And one of the things that I've, I, 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 I must highlight here is that you have the Africa Union's Agenda 2063. At the level of the UN, we have just launched Agenda 2030. And all of these um, uh, 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 development compacts, if you like, talk about economic transformation. And from that perspective, let me extrapolate and look at the whole knowledge economy construct. And that we have a, we, we're, we're, we're looking at the issue of the knowledge economy, the whole impact of electronic technologies and digital technologies, and how that is impacting on the book and, and the publishing industry. Um, we're looking at the sale of ebooks. These are all facets of, of, of the knowledge economy. And then on the other side, you have industrialization impacts. Uh, industrialization impacts uh, in that you have industrial technologies that are as a result of, of industrialization and the digital economy. And we're looking at a whole new era of publishing, an industrialized form of publishing. We also are looking at, um, there are indications that uh, e-tailing or e-online retailing um, will have a whole new dimension, creating a whole new chain of, of, of opportunities. Issues of distribution um, uh, with, with respect to this. So I think that there's a lot that's going on and we have to critically analyze this and, and see where the, we stand with the publishing sector in Africa. But there are challenges, and that's why I said I will also look at the pessimistic side of things. If you look at these two maps on the screen right now, uh, a, a, a bit old, uh, looking at 1999, but it hasn't changed much. And this, this is the map of publishing in the world. And do we see Africa anywhere on that map? So that's, that's my first question. Uh, when you look at the map of global knowledge, looking at issues of access to participation, again, um, it looks at the research production expressed through scientific journals. Uh, it shows the whole exchange of global knowledge. And again, where is Africa? And then let me look at, um, we look at publishing markets, the global map of publishing markets. And again, we're nowhere to be found. When we look at trade in printed materials in Africa, again, we don't do very well. And so against this pessimistic outlook, there is this very optimistic opportunity that is uh, presenting itself. And therefore, how do we move in that, in that direction in terms of taking, taking advantage of the opportunities? So, um, we know that despite reaching almost a billion inhabitants, our publishing industry in Africa accounts for only 2% of the world, what the world publishes. And yet, there's so much 
that we could do. We talk about the fact that we don't have content in our local languages. The fact that we don't have content is an opportunity. So again, it, it, it's really how do we um, change our mindset and how do we turn our problems and our challenges into commercial and, and, and economic opportunities. So something is wrong somewhere and we have to address that. Uh, we know that we export, we import all our, of our textbooks, why? Why do we have to do that? Um, the, uh, the Bibliotheca Alexandrina alone can publish for, the, for the, all the universities on this continent. But we know again that there are other costs that we have to bear in mind, the high cost of production, high paper, issues of IPR, and, and we have to try and address these. So the opportunities are bound. Um, another fact that we need to consider is that uh, by 2020, Africa's uh, households will increase by 43 million. And these are the, the kind of data that we should be playing with. What kind of projections can we do with that? There have been calls recently for the Nollywoodfication of the African book. For those of you from sub-Saharan Africa, Nollywood is the Nigerian film industry, which is uh, equ equivalent to Hollywood. And uh, Kenyan writer uh, Biavanga Wainena is saying that there needs to be a Nollywoodfication of the African book market. And that the way that Nollywood in Nigeria is churning out films, the same can be applied for books being churned out. And, and, and I, I find that very an interesting proposition. And what about the future of our indigenous language publishing in, in Africa? And Butle talked about the fact that uh, children enjoy reading when it starts in their local language. Um, it is not for somebody to create that content. We have to be able to pre create that content and feed that into, into the publishing pipeline. So some way forward, um, uh, national book policies, both of you have talked about that, indigenous language promotion is something that we need to look at. Uh, the book industry itself um, as, in, in, as, as, as a means to promotion of literacy and education in African countries. We need a publishing revolution on this continent, uh, clear publishing strategies. Thank you very much, shukran.